Hey guys, welcome back. Another week means another cannon fodder, so let's get right to it. This week starts with a couple interviews from some people involved with various aspects of Halo. The first interview is with 343 lead writer Brian Reed. As with most interviews, I'll just hit the highlights. Unlike most interviews, I'll try not to let myself rant too much given my, um, <coughs> history with Brian Reed's works. The questions are pretty standard stuff with, and I don't really want to sound too disappointed if I do, pretty vague answers. We get stuff like, what's your favorite part of writing the Halo universe? And what do you like about having comics fill the gaps between games and whatnot? Pretty simple stuff with pretty much the answers you'd expect. However, one question was about Reed's favorite issue of Halo Escalation, to which he responds that it's issue 7. He notes that the issue is a nice break from Halo's usual space opera style of story, focusing more on a single person and how he has to deal with the death of those he cared about, ultimately learning to move forward. I have to say, I agree. While I panned Reed's work with the next 72 hours story arc, I really did like issue 7. It showed that Reed is capable of crafting a well-written narrative. At times. The final question has to do with how Escalation may tie into Halo 5, and Reed actually gives us something of an interesting statement. Quote, Duffy Beaudreau wraps up the Janus Key plot from Spartan Ops, and in doing so actually shifts the galactic balance of power in a very key way for the story we're about to tell in the game. While pretty vague, it does hint that more than a simple showdown between Selene Nayon and Julum Dama can be expected from the next issue of Halo Escalation. I don't want to set my expectations too high, swinging back to the utter disappointment that was the next 72 hours, but still, it's something to keep in mind. The next section is an interview with some of 343's pro team members. It's all very basic, the members having very rudimentary knowledge of Halo lore, their answers to Grimm's questions very reflective of that. I'm not trying to say that's a bad thing, I'm not trying to diss them. I'm just noting that, given that their interest in Halo is much more multiplayer oriented, the interview doesn't really do anything for me. If you're interested in hearing what the pros have to say about their favorite moments and characters in Halo, check the link in the description box and read the article itself. The final part of this week's cannon fodder is probably the best part, addressing a bit of a standing mystery concerning the Cygnus system and the planet of New Jerusalem. Both were first mentioned in Halo Contact Harvest. However, some of the more recent additions to the Halo lore have implied that Cygnus was a planet rather than a system, and that New Jerusalem was a city. From the Rookie's character article, Almost immediately, the 26th MEF deployed to Cygnus, where he saw nearly all of his fellow troopers perish in the Battle of New Jerusalem. As it turns out, New Jerusalem, also known as Cygnus III, is both the name of one of the planets in the Cygnus system, as well as the name of the capital city of that colony. The other planet is known as Cygnus II, often shortened to just Cygnus. So this helps clear up the confusion. Of course, this also leads to another canon issue. Forward unto Dawn character Chyler Silva was born on Cygnus 2, and she notes in the promotional piece Squad that she grew up around a lot of insurrectionist activity. This would seem to conflict with a statement from Halo Contact Harvest, in which Sergeant Johnson notes that Cygnus hadn't really seen much in the way of insurrectionist activity. As it turns out, she being a military brat, Silva's family moved around a lot. While born on Cygnus, she was raised on Mamor, a colony that saw tons of insurrectionist activity over the years, including a nuclear suicide bombing in 2511. The attack prompted the UNSC to bolster its presence on the colony, of which Silva's parents were a part. Going on a bit of a tangent, Memoir has a bit of a history with the Halo universe. An insurrectionist uprising on the planet in 2537 was put down by Spartan 3 Alpha Company. Noble 6 ran a counterinsurgency campaign in May of 2552, where he demonstrated his skills as a saber pilot. This mission in particular is what caught Colonel Holland's attention and led to Six's transfer to Noble Team. Memoir was also mentioned in I Love Bees. And that brings the article to a close, and thus we move forward to the new Halo Universe articles. This week we have the T-55 Turn in Placement, or Shade, the CCS Battlecruiser Indulgence of Conviction, the Runting Mark III B Exoskeleton, or Cyclops, and to my extreme excitement, the homeworld of the Sanshayun seen for the very first time, John Jir Quom. So let's not waste any time and dive right in. We start with the Shade Turret. While the article is subtitled T-55, referring to the variant seen in Halo 4, we do learn quite a bit about other types seen throughout the Halo series. While sometimes new art direction is enough to explain changes, this is an instance where I don't mind that being made a part of the canon. In the canon, the Shade Turrets were originally made by the Assembly Forges on High Charity. Following its destruction, Akko and Weapons, a Sanghili manufacturer, took over its production. So let's look at the different types of Shade Turrets. Going in order of the games where these variants appeared in, we start with the T-29, the variant seen in Halo CE slash CEA, and in Spartan Assault. 
This variant is the oldest model in use by the Covenant. While noted to be inferior to the more modern designs, it is sometimes favored by pious shipmasters due to its antiquity. Next is the T-27, a variant seen in Halo 2 slash Halo 2 Anniversary. The variant is noted as being developed for Covenant Special Forces and is said to be light enough to be self-deployed by Ungoy. Following the war, this variant has seen favor among insurrectionists for its portability and firepower. Next we have the T-26, my personal favorite model. These are the models seen in Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, and Halo Reach. This model is highly versatile with multiple variants seen throughout the war. Some include the anti-air model and the fuel rod gun model. Finally, we have the T-55, the current variant. It's noted that the ones seen on Requiem seem to have no markings connecting it back to Aquam weapons. Either Julem Dama has several highly skilled weapon techs in his ranks, or Aquam is doing some backroom dealings. The article puts forth the former, the latter is just my own thought. Moving forward, we have the Cyclops. Much of the initial stuff is known, but the article does have a bit of new info, notably major and minor variants. The major variants include... Mark 3A, a prototype with a neural interface and a sealed canopy that would be mirrored in later Mjolnir EVA variants. Mark 3B, this is the one we're familiar with from Halo Wars. Mark 3B-2, an unofficial designation for a variant with a much more robust, sealed cockpit. They often see the expensive fusion reactor swapped out for a hydrogen-burning turbine or high-density power cell. Mark 3B-1, a variant upgraded by Hannibal Weapon Systems to feature composite plating and hardpoints for weapon installation. The variation saw popularity with paramilitary groups in some Earth cities. The Mark III M1, a variant made by Lethbridge Industrial. Currently undergoing field trials with the UNSC Army, this variant features shoulder-mounted heavy weapon hardpoints and titanium aid plating. Next up are the minor variants. These ones are very interesting as it seems that they're actually canonizing some of the Mega Block Cyclops models. We have Peacekeeper, a variant of the Mark III-A popular in SWAT units in Earth megacities. The variant is equipped with a riot shield and a low-pressure autocannon capable of firing a variety of munitions for riot control. It seems most of these were destroyed when pressed into active combat duty. Protector, this is a variant of the Mark III-B1 used in civilian rescue. Often equipped with a tank of fire retardant foam and high pressure projector, the variant is used in situations where vehicles are not viable and an unprotected worker would be at high risk. The variant also has a high torque gripping arm for tearing into vehicles or breaking through reinforced walls. Breaker, a variant specializing in ship breaking and construction, these are usually mounted with plasma cutters, hydraulic rams, and a variety of cutting blades. Vacuum sealed, they are most often contracted to cut up destroyed ships and stations in Earth's orbit or excavate the remains of buildings on glassed worlds. Finally, Hazops, exactly what it sounds like, the Hazop variant is used for operation in hazardous zones, such as places where flood samples are contained. At the end of a successful operation, the suits are usually destroyed to ensure no flood supercells survive. Of note, the UNSC has explored through simulation what may happen if a pilot and Cyclops were to be captured by the flood. This would seem to explain that flood Cyclops from this year's Toy Fair. And finally, we get Jean Jirkwom seen for the very first time. What's very interesting is the article seems to imply that the image we see is that of John Jerquom after the reformists left in the Dreadnought, this large section of ocean here seeming to be where the chunk that became High Charity once was. At least that's how I read it. As for the article itself, most of the information is known. Well, it's known if you've read Halo Broken Circle. The article ends with the usual bit about John Jerquom being destroyed, but many finding the claim to be suspicious because that's what you do when the Sun Shayum say anything. Anyway, that brings this week's cannon fodder to a close. Regarding Halo New Blood, the review will be up by Tuesday this week at the latest. Until then, this has been Halo Cannon, and I'll see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for watching my video. It means more than I can express in a few minutes of audio. If you did like it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, share it around on whatever social media you see fit, and all that jazz. Thank you so much. Your support is everything. I would not be where I am without you. Thanks.